the former U.S. Um, Surgeon General was David Satcher. It was very, very exciting, and um, just even more sort of energy and fodder to continue taking on this uh, racism as a public health crisis. So, if you have, if you weren't able to join, their recording will be um, on their website. So check it out. So I'm Jessica Collins. I am the executive director of the Public Health Institute of Western Mass. And I am here with just amazing teammates and all of you. And thank you so much for joining us today to learn more about how to use um, our COVID-19 data dashboard. And um, I know we only have about 60 minutes and we have a tremendous panel. So I just want to just very quickly go over um, kind of how this presentation will go. If you have questions, please put them in the chat box. We're going to keep everyone muted. And then as appropriate and timing allows, we will ask you to unmute yourself um, to ask your question or we'll just read it right out of the, uh, the chat box. So now I want to introduce to you um, a great friend Dr. Christina Hebna Torres. She is the Vice President of Research and Population Health at Caring Health Center, and she is also the President uh, of the Public Health Institute of Western Mass, and she's going to be our moderator today. So, Christina, I'm handing it over to you. Buenos dias. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much, Jessica, for that introduction, and thanks so much to all of you for joining us today, including our panelists. Um, I'm thrilled to be here with you and really appreciative of the work that Public Health Institute of Western Mass has done to create this COVID-19 data dashboard and also for all of us to be together on their first ever webinar, which I know will likely be the first of many to come. So um, it's exciting to be able to be uh, in conversation with each other on that. Um, Taking time from your day to day, we know that there are a lot of questions about data and needing to discuss with a range of stakeholders that we all serve that we're a part of about how we're utilizing data in the state um, and in our regions. There are barriers so far that we've been experiencing around data and many of us are taking different steps to try and uh, find access accurate data and then translate that into meaningful next steps with our community members. I know for myself as a community health leader and as a social epidemiologist, we're constantly trying to make decisions based on data, things like PPE, things like developing policy and keeping our communities safe um, and how we deliver excellent care. So knowing that, I wanna make sure that um, the data app dashboard is a tool that is well understood and accessed by the community. Um, we can ask questions today about how best to use it or questions about it, but also we're gonna hear from, um, from Dr. Kathleen Zegda uh, from the Public Health Institute of Western Mass about how the dashboard was developed and its functions and features. And we're gonna hear from a panel of three presenters today. Um, we're fortunate to be joined today by uh, State Representative Mindy Dom, uh, Meg Birch, and Gail Gamarosa. Uh, first, I'd like to start by introducing Dr. Kathleen Zegda um, to share with us about the development and the features of the COVID-19 dashboard. Um, we'll then hear from our three panelists. And as Jessica mentioned, while all of this is going on, any questions that you have along the way, please put them in the chat box so you don't forget them. Um, and then we'll uh, collect those and either we'll be able to ask all the questions given the number that there are, or if there are far more than what can be asked altogether, Jessica will make sure to identify themes of questions that are coming up and do our best to get through as many as possible. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Kathleen Zegda to uh, share with us the COVID-19 data dashboard, and then we'll move into our panelist section and question and answer after that. Thank you. I just, Kathleen, sorry, before you go, I just wanna recognize Senator Comerford has joined us and with the multiple pages, if there are other um, uh, leaders of such high esteem. I'm sorry, we'll recognize you as we see your name. So I just wanted to give Senator Comerford a shout out. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you for joining. Okay, so um, welcome everyone. We're so glad to have you um, and have you participate in our webinar. So I am going to be speaking to, um, hold on one second, I'm just going to pull this up give a little bit of an overview of our data dashboard, as Christina was saying, and how, here we go. So 
um, how it originated. So um, we decided to do this data dashboard because we were hearing from people about need for data specific to Western Mass at a regional level. And we had several people reach out and we were pulling together data um, for people and also just looking into what was available. Um, and so based on what we we're hearing, we, the state had switched their reporting and started providing more county level data. So we decided to try to pull together data in one place for each of the Western Massachusetts counties so that people could have information, um, relevant, timely information to understand what's going on with COVID in their county. So on the screen right now, you can see this is our website and this is the data, um, county data dashboards that we have. And we have both for the state and then each, each of the Western Massachusetts counties. And what I'm gonna do is because we have also uh, county specific pages, I'm gonna go to one of these county pages as I talk about what the different um, boxes in the dashboard are, and then also just a little more information about some of the other data we have for each of the counties over um, with indicators over time. So for this, I'm gonna use Hampshire County as my example. Um, you can see, so we update this every week and we do our best to get it up um, Thursday morning. The state releases their weekly report on Wednesday evening. And this information, um, some of it is in, in that report. So we do the best we can to update this. And so you'll see that we have the current two week period. There's a little bit of a lag with when the state releases their report and the two week period. They have to compile everything. And then they compare the data for this current two week period to the prior two week period. So um, for when they're indicating increases or decreases, that's what they're comparing to. You'll see that there's an overlap in these two weeks periods. And I just wanted to note that because there have been questions about that. And the way that the state is calculating um, their data and doing comparisons, they're rolling estimates or rolling averages. And so, um, even though the, the reports are um, weekly, they're reporting on each of those weeks for the prior two week period. And it's a way to be able, because there's gonna be variability, for example, in cases um, on a daily basis. And so it's a way to smooth some of that out and look more overall at, to see if there are um, increases or decreases over time. So next I'll walk through what some of these different um, boxes are in our dashboard. So you'll see that there are columns for cases, numbers of cases, um, and also columns for tests. And these are really important to look at um, together to understand the information that you're seeing. And then we also have included um, information on the number of deaths that have occurred over the past two weeks as well. And so looking specifically at cases, this first box here is confirmed cases and um, the, the larger number is over the last two, this two, current two week period. And so these are confirmed by molecular tests. There are different tests that they can do to be able to um, identify cases. So there's molecular and then there's also antigen tests. These are molecular tests. And then it's compared to the prior two week period. And then, which in this case is 52, and you'll see we've indicated there's a decrease. So um, for most of these, the arrows are indicative of whether it is um, an increase or decrease based on the numbers. Um, you'll see when I speak to the percent positive that that's based on um, something a little different that the state uses. We also indicate the total number of confirmed cases that have occurred since COVID started, just as a way to put this in context to see. Um, so you can see in the last two weeks, there have been 21 confirmed cases identified um, and the number comparatively to the total as a whole. So below that is the average daily cases per 100,000 people um, during the current two week period. So you can see that um, the, the number is 0.9 and it's pretty low and it's lower than what it was in the prior two week period. 
and lower uh, than it was for the state as a whole, a bit lower. And putting it into this rate is a way to be able to compare across areas with different population sizes. So the state um, uses this, and I'll speak briefly to that in their community map when comparing across communities. So moving to the next column are the tests in the current two week period. Again, these are um, molecular tests. And so in this case, 32,742, a slight increase than the previous period. And then below that are the percent positive tests. And so um, in the two week period. So among all the te these tests that were conducted, what percent were positive? And you can see that has decreased since the prior two week period and it is a bit lower than Massachusetts as a whole. This will give a sense, again, it's based on the number of tests and the number of cases. So it really is dependent um, in a part of it is on absolutely on the number of tests. And it indicates if there's um, a large, uh, a more community spread, but also testing capacity. So the benchmark used for this is to try and have that below 5%. And then you'll see that we've included the number of deaths um, and the number of cumulative confirmed and probable deaths as well. So for each county, we also have the um, data over time. So on uh, August 12th, the state changed how they were reporting and I believe it was August 12th, right around there. And so we are, since that time, we've started to include um, and post on our website some of these data indicators over time. So it's helpful. So this one is confirmed cases in over the past two week period um, to get a sense of it, are there trends in terms of number of new cases. So looking at the last two weeks, um, does there seem to be some, um, a, a trend towards increase or a trend towards decrease? Um, we expect there will be some variability. So you'll see this here. Um, and then you'll see that it looks like there seems to be a trend towards decreasing. So it's important to look over time as well. And again, you see a, a corresponding decrease in the incidence per 100,000 that you can see um, is related to the number of new cases. And if you look at the test and over time as well, you'll see there's been a large increase over time. In Hampshire County, we see that, um, and what we know is that some of the, the university and colleges have begun asymptomatic testing. So that would impact potentially the number of cases you would see as well. So whereas before it was only among people who were showing up with symptoms and they would be tested, now we're seeing people being tested um, within um, some of the universities and colleges on a weekly and in some instances students on a bi-weekly basis. So um, who's being tested is important to, to know as well. And then you'll see below that the percent positivity over time. And so you'll see that that decreases as the number of cases has increased. And also um, it, it is important to then think about the number of new cases because that will impact that as well. Um, but you'll see that in this case, the percent positivity um, was decreasing substantially as the number of cases increased. In addition to the county level data, um, we also have on our website community level data that the state is reporting weekly. So they have a map. Um, I should note one, one uh, limitation of the county level data that we currently have access to is that we are not able to disaggregate by um, race and ethnicity or age. So um, we're hoping that that will become available, um, but currently we are not. And so we're not able to examine some of the inequities that we um, know exist within our region as, as part of, the, of COVID. So just quickly looking at this community level map, you're able to um, see based on these are the categories the state has put out. So I had mentioned this is that um, di average daily uh, cases per 100,000 over the last two weeks. And green is indicative of when there are fewer than four cases per 100,000. 
yellow is four to eight and red is more than eight. And the state has put out some guidance to schools um, about whether being in person or hybrid or remote based on this. Um, gray is, is different. It is not a rate. And it is when a community or has a population of less than 50,000 and fewer than five reported cases. It can be challenging to interpret some of this in smaller communities um, because the case number could be really small, yet it could be that the, um, the color is red. We saw that recently with, um, for example, in West Hampton, where there were five cases in a two week period. Because the population is about 1,600 people, um, their average daily incidence was 21, um, but it was a small number of cases and it's hard for communities to interpret or even some of these where it's not um, colored. So um, that is just a brief overview of the, some of the data that we have available. It's meant to give a regional perspective with the county level data and then also to be able to um, make easily accessible to people their community level data and then they can just click on their community and see again this is what the state has put out but we put this on our website um, the total cases that have occurred in the last two weeks and then also the average daily incidence rate per 100,000. And we'll have a chance to open it up to Q&A um, a little later. So Christina, I'll go ahead and turn it back over to you. Thank you so much, Kathleen. That was a really excellent presentation. And I know I can already see in the chat that a lot of people are commenting on uh, the need for this. Uh, so hoping that this is really helping to clarify some of the important messages. I want to uh, join Jessica in welcoming Senator Comerford as well as representatives Fairly Bouvier and Blaze to the call as well. Appreciate everybody's attendance uh, to all of the attendees and to the um, a priority that this webinar is being given uh, with your attendance. Much appreciated. And now I'd really love to introduce our panelists today. Um, we're joined uh, by three members of the community who are going to give their perspectives on three questions and I'll pose those in just a moment. And the way this will work is each panelist is going to have about seven minutes to share their thoughts um, and they'll get a one minute cue for when they're nearly done uh, with their time. And once all three have had a chance to present, We'll open it up to Q&A, which as I mentioned earlier, if you've just joined the call, please place your questions in the chat and we'll do our best to summarize questions individually or as themes as we go through. So first, uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce State Senator, I mean State, Rep, State Representative, excuse me, Mindy Dom, who is the third Hampshire District uh, representative, including Amherst, Pelham and uh, Precinct 1 in Granby. Prior to being elected to office, she was the executive director of the Amherst Survival Center, where she oversaw a delivery of a range of resources and services um, and uh, basic need programs. Prior to that, she worked uh, in the HIV epidemic since the 1980s, overseeing team, um, teams and testing in Western Massachusetts, providing community education, uh, pressuring for federal response to the epidemic, and working with people in jail, substance users, and drug and alcohol treatment providers. So we are very fortunate to have you join today and are very interested to hear your thoughts on the questions that we'll be posing as it relates to the work that you're currently doing in Massachusetts and your perspective representing your constituents. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Next, I'd like to introduce uh, Meg Birch. Meg has been the district leader for the Frontier Regional and Union 38 district schools for the past five years a building-based elementary school nurse for nine years and is a nationally certified school nurse. Meg has been a guest lecturer in the nursing program at Greenfield Community College and serves on the nursing uh, program advisory board. Meg holds an MS in epidemiology and worked as an epidemiologist prior to obtaining her degree in nursing. And in addition, she works for the school district. Meg is currently on staff in the, as a public health nurse with the Cooperative Public Health Service in the Franklin Regional Council of Governments. She previously served on local boards of health and school committee. Thank you, Meg, so much for joining us today. Appreciate you being here. And lastly, I'd like to introduce Gail Gramarusa. Gail is the Evaluation and Technical Assistance Specialist in the Department of Healthy uh, Children and Families at the Collaborative for Educational Services based in Northampton, Massachusetts. 
Um, she also serves as the chair and the facilitator of the Quebec uh, Hills Substance Use Alliance since its establishment in 2014 and serves as the program director of the Quebec Hills Drug Free Communities Project. She's volunteer and co-chair of the Base, um, Bay State Eastern Regions um, Community Benefits Advisory Council and also serves 15 communities crossing Hamden and Hampshire and Worcester community. I'd really like to uh, join you all in welcoming our three panelists to the call. And right now we're gonna hand it over to them to really hear their thoughts on three critical questions that you are all thinking about. One is how are you and the people that you're working for or your constituents using the dashboard and the COVID-19 dashboard or just COVID data currently? What are the challenges of using the data or the challenges that you've faced with data so far during the COVID-19 pandemic? And what next steps are you taking or engaging in regarding COVID-19 data? So we'll, um, we'll, we'll begin with uh, um, Representative and hear your thoughts on each of these three questions. Thank you so much and hi everybody. This is exciting that so many people are interested in not only getting the data, understanding it and using it, and before I begin to answer some of those questions, I just want to thank the Public Health Institute of Western Massachusetts for their initiative in developing the dashboard, creating this webinar, really getting the word out. You're such a valuable community resource. And um, I'm hoping that for people who may not be familiar with your work, this dashboard is actually going to make them very familiar with it. So I just want to really express my gratitude. And also because um, it helps me and it helps my staff and my constituents understand what's going on in our community. So I think the way I use data is as a former HIV educator, um, and I've said this to some people on this call, epidemiology and data is critical. It's not only important in terms of our being able to develop policies that are data-driven and reality-based, but it can also be used to inform and build awareness in a community about what the experience of the pandemic is, and that awareness can be used to compel action. So that action can be either on the personal level to remind people to practice prevention or get tested, but it can also compel legislative action. Um, I think that uh, I use, the, I look at the data every day. I try to put out um, information from what's going on uh, from the state report to my constituents, and I find my constituents are really interested in understanding the data. And as a result, I've also learned the um, many problems with the way the state is actually producing the data. It's not always in a user-friendly way. It's not always explained why they choose to include or exclude information at different times. And we're all aware that in this public health crisis, transparency is critically important. Um, and the report serves that purpose. But when you start mixing things up or not explaining things in an easy to understand way, it's no longer transparent. It's actually very opaque. So um, I use it because I wanna understand what's going on in the region and in the community. In Western Mass, um, the county data, any, actually I think any area outside of Boston, county data is critical. Um, and I would prefer to see the state produce not only the race and ethnicity data and the age breakdown data, but monthly or weekly um, surveillance reports by county, including higher ed campuses, hospitals, et cetera, all the other data that they sort of put in different places. Um, the challenges are that um, what I found um, is that we don't always get the data we need from the state, and um, we don't always get it in the time frame that we need it. Um, that is a problem. I know many legislators on this phone call, Senator Comerford and Rep. Lay, um, in particular from Hampshire County and Hampshire Franklin, we've been active in trying to request more data and more explicit data from the department. Those requests have not always been favorable. So in terms of the third question, next steps, um, then you go to legislation. You know, you kind of ask and say, what, you know, is this possible? You assume it should be because they have the data, um, but then you go to legislation and require it. And it's not clear to me why we don't get all the data we want. It's not clear if they are just sort of very busy and overwhelmed. So that reveals a staffing issue that the legislature could also sort of be supportive with, or if there's a reluctance to share. I don't wanna to go to the latter part, but 
I want to admit that my constituents have felt that way, that they have felt that the state has been hesitant to provide data that they've wanted. Um, and so in the past like a couple of months, I've introduced some legislation that has been about data disclosure. Um, one piece was around the Department of Corrections, which then the Department of Public Health started to do. And in the next week, I'll also be introducing legislation to require very specific county data. So hopefully um, that will be sort of a nudge, uh, another nudge to the department and they'll be able to release additional data. We need race and ethnicity data. We need age breakdown. They took out the age breakdown for the state just as K through 12 and higher ed campuses were opening. Makes no sense. We know that we wanna be looking at all ages, especially in the younger frame, um, brackets um, when schools are reopening, it disappeared. We certainly want that on a county basis. Um, but we may also want to see towns on a county basis and other information that's available, but just not all put together in one place. Um, on that, I just want to say how grateful again I am to the Public Health Institute for taking what is available and putting it together. And I hope that we can work together moving forward to get you more. If I can say one more thing, and I, don't, I hope I'm not at my seven minute light. Um, I've often said when I was in the AIDS epidemic, that the epidemiology, sometimes people feel like they can't understand it unless they went to public health school. And I think you understand it much better when you have a public health degree, but it can be clearly um, shared with people who don't have a public health background to build their own sense of knowledge about what's happening. And that is critical to our ability to contain and combat the pandemic. If that tree falls in the forest, and no one's around, does it make a sound? I think probably, right? But the data and the surveillance reports help to amplify what's happening in that forest. And if we don't have it, then we don't understand it. And then we can't meet needs that result from it. And that's bad government. And that's not really taking care of each other. So that's all I'll say. I'll stop and let my, my panelists go. Thank you. Thank you so much for those comments and for that feedback. Um, we're going to dive into question and answer after we hear from our two panelists. And I'd love to hand it over now to Meg Birch. If you could share your thoughts on those three questions or any com combination of them uh, based yep. on your experience so far with things. Absolutely. Um, so and I, I want to also thank you for um, inviting me here today and thank you for the work that you have been doing in terms of providing the aggregate um, data and, and the information to interpret it. Um, so I am from Frontier Regional um, School District, which um, is in uh, Franklin County. There are five schools in four towns. Um, we're not fully regionalized, so we have five school committees. Um, we have four different boards of health that we have to work with um, just within our school district. But I did a little math to figure out that about 75% of our students um, live in district. Um, about a third of our staff live in district. And aside from our four towns, um, we have 54 additional towns, uh, municipalities that we could have to work with um, to respond to um, a case or a potential uh, close contact within our schools. Um, fortunately for us, about 12 of those towns are part of the Cooperative Public Health Service, so that narrows down the players a little bit. But um, how, I, how I've been using this data um, is um, starting in July, school committee members and community members um, were asking the district how we were going to make decisions about when it was safe to reopen and which model we were going to choose and um, what would prompt a closure. And this was prior to the state coming out with their, um, their community map and their, and their metrics. Um, and so we had put some information together, scouring both the um, DPH website and other sites um, and had had something that was reasonable. We then integrated the state data, but the big missing piece for us was the regional data, the countywide data, because as um, Kathleen stated so nicely that the ch there's challenges of interpreting um, the data on the community maps when you have very small communities. Um, and our largest town is, um, I don't even think it's 5,000 people. Um, 
you know, of our four towns. So um, we really are using the data to inform conversations with um, school committee, to inform conversations with our local boards of health around the, the community metrics that we're using um, to determine when we would, um, when we would close. We are uh, one of the few districts in Franklin County that is um, doing a hybrid model of learning. So we have some students in our buildings and we'll be bringing um, more in starting next week. Um, so um, just the, the region of the county level data and then um, also the, the ability for us to look at the trends is really helpful. Um, in terms of the challenges, one of the things that um, I know our boards of health are concerned about is understanding when the numbers are indicating community spread, um, when the numbers are indicating maybe um, something going on in a congregate setting, um, or um, right now there's concern about just the level, um, the, the testing within the boarding schools in our communities. Um, and how that's um, skewing the data um, at the level of asymptomatic testing. Um, and we've, we've been able to have really good conversations using all of the data on um, the regional data from your website um, to really put the testing data itself in context and to be able to, I think, um, bring the conversation and the knowledge forward for our local boards of health members in terms of understanding um, the, the, the relevance of the different pieces of data to a decision. Um, and also the importance of us having um, um, internal data. So um, I know my time is almost up. Um, I think, um, I mean, there's a lot more challenges for us being a rural school district. I think in terms of continuing next steps, it's really um, the testing continues to be a concern of our boards um, in terms of um, will we, um, what will happen if there's a delay in, in uh, turnaround time or a delay in capacity and, and will that create a lag in our ability to respond to community or school-wide um, trends. Um, and then the challenges of reporting data to our communities and um, being transparent when um, in small communities, privacy and confidentiality is, um, is critical. And so we're, we're continuing to have conversations with the public health nurses and school administrators around that. So, and I could talk for a lot longer, but my time is up. Thank you. Thank you. Christina, you're muted. She's still <laughs> muted. Am I unmuted now? Okay. I can't unmute myself. Sorry about that, everybody. <laughs> I apologize for that delay. Thank you so much, Meg, for those comments and that insight uh, into the experiences that you've been having. Um, I'd like to ask Gail to join us now in responding to the same questions from your perspective. Great, thank you. Good thank afternoon, you. everybody. Uh, great to see lots of Western Mass folks that I know names and faces of. So thank you as well to the Public Health Institute and others who have orchestrated this. I would just reinforce the value of something that's local, easier to wade through than uh, statewide and state government reports certainly easier and more reliable potentially than than what we're hearing from the federal level. Um, I also just really appreciate the fact that the folks that are looking at this data, analyzing it and depicting it on the dashboard, they live and work and know Western Massachusetts. So I find that very helpful and uh, to me adds, uh, adds that level of, of uh, confidence in that they they understand our region so I feel like that's uh, very important a lot of my work as you heard earlier I wear a number of different hats I live in the community of 
of Belchertown. I served on their Board of Health for almost a, two decades. Um, and, and I'm in that region that we call the Quaybog Hills, and it's at the margins of Hamden, Hampshire, and Worcester County. A lot of small towns that you might pass through on your way to somewhere else. And one of the, what we're, we're working on in terms of the, the first question, really also letting no, those smaller communities and the community leaders, both official and unofficial informal community leaders, coalitions and different entities know about the dashboard and how to use it and how to look at it from their perspective. Um, again, sometimes countywide data can be very helpful. I appreciate that. But when you are in a community where work and commerce and school districts and just life in general often cross county boundaries, mm -hmm. um, it's sometimes a challenge to compare what's happening in your sphere to what's happening at a countywide level, particularly when you are farther away from some of the major urban areas in those counties. So that's just one challenge that a region like the Quaybog Hills faces. There are other regions in the state, I think, who have similar kinds of, of challenges. I appreciate what Meg said about regional school districts. That happens in, in our region as well, that if you're trying to get a good handle on what's happening and what kinds of decisions should be made with respect to uh, school and how it's operating, uh, when you have multiple municipalities, that becomes a bit of a challenge. How do you look at that data? How do you understand it? How does that help you inform decision making? Um, just one, you know, an, an additional challenge, and I would just raise it, and, and maybe our elected state level officials can also look at it. I absolutely support the uh, concepts that looking uh, at a deeper level at race, ethnicity, age, gender, other kinds of demographic factors, very important to get a picture of what's happening in a community or region. I would add economics to that because again, in the Quaybog Hills region, where racially it is predominantly a, a white region in that sense, we have small percentages of African American, Latino, uh, even Asian, Native American, Hawaiian, Pacific Islander, but small percentages many of the community members at highest risk are the lowest economic level and they are in those frontline jobs where they may be most exposed potentially those lower wage jobs so i would just make a plug for i know that adds a whole nother layer of data analysis but i feel like economics and how this uh, uh, pandemic has shown both uh, racial ethnic and other inequities it's also really you know shined a light on the economic inequities so that's just one challenge that i think that we're that we're facing um, next steps to be working on further communicating the availability of the dashboard helping organizations and groups understand it and then i would add how does this data help us to reinforce the kinds of collective action that we want our communities to take, both at the individual family level, how are you protecting you and the people you care about? How are you then helping to protect your community? Are you following guidelines? And can we reinforce the continuation and sustainability of those behaviors? One concern I sometimes have is when because we are so anxious for this to feel like it is done. When we hear that numbers are improving and things are getting better, very, uh, very human-like behavior to want to revert to our old, our old habits. And how do we continue to support the majority of people who I think are taking the right measures and behaving in ways we would we would want to support and reinforce, but how do we sustain it? Um, particularly in smaller communities where sometimes we feel like, well, we're done, we're, we're finished, we're not so bad. It's, it's a big city problem. Um, and how, you know, what, what we all can do in our various roles to sustain that, I think is just another, another step going forward and another challenge that we might face. Can you hear me? Oh, great. 
Thank you so much. Um, I want to take a moment to just um, acknowledge each of your uh, thoughts and, and comments so far um, and appreciate the fact that you're coming at this from um, unique perspectives in some ways and still with quite a bit of overlap. The charge is clear that there are very real barriers that each of you in representing your communities or your constituents are facing in terms of the level and quality of the data that are even being made available, um, but also the, the call to action to be able to um, have access to those data and then make use of those data in, um, in meaningful ways that are both sustainable but are also responsive to how the pandemic is changing over time. Um, so thank you. And um, we have a series of really important questions that have shown up in the chat. I know that um, we want to use the majority of the remaining period to jump into a question and answer um, section. And so I'd like to um, offer either Jessica an opportunity to call out some of the questions um, or for um, individual uh, questions to be brought up. Yeah, well, why don't we, thank you, Christina, and thank yes. everyone. Why don't we jump back up to the questions that came through right after Kathleen's presentation, which are much okay. more specific to the dashboard. Okay. So Kathleen, the question from Steph Solis is, you mentioned a possible limitation in the county level data, but are there any particular limitations, i.e. data you wish you saw at the community level? Yeah, that's a that's an excellent question. Um, thanks for for asking that and raising that one up, Jessica. I think some of the same types of data we we speak to at the county level and as Gail has brought up as well would be helpful to hear. So some of the understanding more about disaggregation, particularly um, by age and and other things. But one of the things that I think has been really important and brought up as well is the context that this is happening. And Meg brought this up, whether it's happening in for a congregate living situations. So mm -hmm. for example, is it, are we seeing um, an increase in cases and it's, it's mostly driven because there was an outbreak at a long-term care facility and thus not indic indicative of community spread. I think that's what people in our communities are wanting to understand so that they can make decisions in schools and mm -hmm. other places about whether they need to if um, continue or go remote or whatever decisions that they're making. So I think that, and that's about having information flow um, and context for the data as part of it. I think that's what we're hearing most. And then it's not community level, but again, um, we heard some of this from Meg and Gail. Um, we've been hearing from people about regional school districts and as uh, Representative Dom is saying, um, be, having that data where it's combined for regional school districts. So it's not at the county level, it's, it's a, more than community, but having it so that it is accessible, easily accessible to people to use for decision-making. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. And then Kelly Tice had a couple of specifics. She said, I noticed some weeks overlap, how does that work? Mm -hmm. And then the second is, do you think we'll ever get statistics by race and ethnicity? Okay. So again, very good questions. And we've received the questions about overlapping weeks from a few different folks, even uh, emails on the dashboard. Um, it is confusing. And I was trying to explain when I was presenting and I think that um, even still it's confusing. Uh, so the, the state is doing essentially two week periods and it's a rolling two week period. So, it, there is some overlap. So for some on their daily dashboard example, it, if they're doing a prior two week period, then it's re being reported daily and it makes more sense to people because the weekly report is coming out and it's for the prior two week period or the two week period from that report then and they compare from one daily or weekly report to the previous week's report then they are, the state is comparing um, uh, data where there is an overlap for one week of that. Um, I had mentioned that part of the doing the um, rolling estimates is to be able to um, understand changes, but then some smoothing when there's daily variability. 
So it is confusing to people and we've thought about changing, but we have an advisory group um, that we've spoken with as well. And it, we feel that it's important to keep it consistent with how the state is reporting and comparing, which is why we've kept it as it is. I hope that answers the question. Um, it's, it's a confusing thing to explain. And then regarding the race and ethnicity data, um, I'm not certain. I had put in a request to the state uh, I, in the late spring and then again over the summer to get the race and ethnicity data. And we have not been able to get it. I know that they have a lot going on um, at the state level. I'm hopeful with Representative Dom's um, legislation that she is putting forth that includes um, having data reported by county and race and ethnicity um, disaggregated amongst other things that we may be able to see it. But um, uh, so far. Tom, would you like to respond to that piece of legislation? Thank you. Um, well, I hope we do. I mean, one way or the other, either legislation will compel it or they'll start um, sharing it in addition to age breakdown, which we talked about. Um, listening to what Gail suggested and then the second question, I started thinking about something that we had not included in the, in the draft legislation, which I can still include, which is exposure category. Because I think that income is more going to be like sort of in Kathleen's neck of the woods of looking at census data and maybe overlaying that in with it. But occupation, um, congregate housing, like those kinds of how did that person, how did that exposure yeah. happen? In the very beginning of the pandemic, they listed exposure categories. And then when the numbers got so immense, they stopped. They just assumed everything was community spread or the majority was community spread. Mm -hmm. But I think we can make the case that on the county level, we need to roll it back a little bit. The numbers are not that much significant. We should be able to do it. And this might be an interesting way of getting occupation. And that would be a way to document um, the impact on essential workers. Um, so I'm going to take that with me and I'm going to work with the people at Mass um, Committee on Occupational Safety and Health and sort of tweak that a little bit and to include it. I don't know if that'll make it happen, but we've discovered that legislation sometimes gives the governor a good nudge. So mm -hmm. we'll keep our fingers crossed. Jessica, before you go to the next one, um, yeah. I just wanted to ask Representative Dom if I could just ask, in addition to race, ethnicity, would there be a way to include language? And I'm asking because the research at Caring Health has really found that um, even within racial categories, you have very diverse cultural backgrounds and cultural and religious practices and beliefs. Um, so for instance, in our, in our count of, of white patients that might actually represent um, Arabic speaking or Russian speaking or English speaking, and that can represent a vast range of general uh, um, cultural health belief practices and, and um, context in which people might need the information rolled out in different ways. Just curious if that would be able to be added. I, I can certainly add it. I think I want to just point out that I think the big difference between um, collecting the data on COVID-19 and like, let's say HIV or AIDS mm -hmm. is that the data is not coming from a case report form, which would be filled out by a physician who would be seeing the patient face to face or a medical provider being able to ask these questions, complete it and send it in. That's how it's done with um, disease surveillance, mm -hmm. but this is based on testing surveillance. Mm -hmm. So it's based on what people report on their forms that they're submitting to their testing provider. Um, but that doesn't mean we can't ask for it. I just want to also point out that that's sort of a caveat. Mm -hmm. um, people can skip. I know in the very beginning when they started releasing race and ethnicity data for the whole state, they were, it was way out of line with the numbers of people because so many people hadn't filled out that, that information. Mm -hmm. um, and the testing provider is not the best person to get all that information. Mm -hmm. So a medical provider, trusted medical provider is easier. But we can certainly put preferred language as Thank an institution you. that we need that information to be able to make good decisions. I love that. That would be great. Thank you. And in the time remaining, Michelle, you've been firing off questions in the chat. So I want to give you an opportunity to pick your, your best question right now to be answered. And then unfortunately, we'll, we'll have to start wrapping up. So you can unmute. Wow. I get to pick one, huh? Wow. 
Hmm, boy, I have so many. Uh, one of the, the things that is running through my head a lot um, is children at risk. So just children at risk for, um, they're at risk for the coronavirus, but is, uh, at risk for hunger in their home, um, having a parent who's working, so being alone in their home and they're in kindergarten or, you know, whatever. What, I'm in healthcare um, compliance. What can we do? Uh, what can boards of health do? What, what can people do to, uh, to help with that, especially in relation to this dashboard, but in other ways too? Okay, so we got to troubleshoot who's going to answer that. Any of the panelists want to take a shot at that, at a response for that? I think, that, you know, the, the thing I'm left with is that we don't even have age breakdown information right now. Um, so we have research that's going on about risk, the risk of infection and the risk of transmission from kids that's coming out. In fact, right now, CDC put out a, a report that actually demonstrated um, some or described some level of vulnerability to not only infection, but illness. But at this point, at the state level, we have to convince the department to restore the age breakdown for the state because they've removed that so that we can actually see how many um, how many youth are being tested and of that number how many are positive but we don't have that data right now so I would say it kind of goes back for me it goes back to getting the information that data I'm not sure if that answers your question <laughs> I, I was going to speak a little bit to it. I don't know if I'll be able to answer fully, but I thinking from a school perspective, um, you know, we we do have have pretty good knowledge of the um, which families within our community are um, vulnerable in terms of you know some data indicators um, that get reported to the state um, based on you know economic um, economic need. Um, and I think an advantage of a small-ish district like ours is that we're able to really reach out directly to families um, to, you know, to assess whether they have what they need in terms of basics, as well as in terms of what they need for their children to access their education. But it really is a local effort. It's not something that's happening um, in a more widespread way, though there's a lot of resources, at least Franklin County has a lot of resources available um, and a lot of uh, information has been pulled together that um, with all of the, the community programs and, and such for families, but I don't know, it doesn't fully answer your question. Uh, Christina, I just might add too, I've seen, I've seen some efforts in the Quaybog Hills region where medical providers, faith leaders, uh, town officials, law enforcement, other groups are trying to band together to even, you know, reconsider how might we be able to address hunger. I know it's not directly related to the dashboard, but I, I certainly agree. Most providers are saying that they are seeing increases in those needs with the economic impact of, of the pandemic. Um, and some collaborations where people are getting very creative in how they might collect, distribute, and refer folks to uh, programs to deal to deal with hunger. And I guess along the way, you know, it's more qualitative, anecdotal information, but it also gives a community a window into what some of its more urgent, basic needs might be that may then help shape not only uh, short-term response, but also longer-term efforts to try to, you know, address some of those underlying uh, social inequities that I think were always there, but have been really heightened by the pandemic and, and, and maybe hunger and issues of housing instability being two of them. That's such a good point, Gail. You know. Because I see that in my district in, between Amherst and Granby in, in meetings about how groups are forming these collaborations and partnerships. And sometimes it's for the first time, but it's allowing them to see into each other's world, whether it's the Amherst Survival Center and Granby to go get grab and go, and also how they're able to partner with each other. That could be a great second webinar right there. <laughs> Go ahead. No, go ahead. I just was going to note that I had put in the chat that um, 
many school districts are providing uh, grab and go breakfast and lunch. Um, and I know, um, you know, in our, in our district, and I'm, I'm aware of many other districts that are doing the same, that it's for any resident under the age of 18. Um, and then in some cases, um, also providing um, meals to um, seniors. And those can be, in our district, those can be picked up, but we also, um, over the summer, um, did deliver meals. Um, and I think Franklin Tech uh, last spring was using their bus routes to deliver meals um, around Franklin County. Um, you know, which I think is especially important where you have a county where there's not public transportation. Mm -hmm. Um, and for a lot of people, the, you know, the cost of gas to get into Greenfield is, is prohibitive if they live in one of the hill towns, um, East or East County. It's one of those things with the pandemic that it's not revealed like we didn't know it, but allowed it to be publicly shared that schools, that we've relied on schools for more than just teaching our kids. Mm -hmm. We've relied on them mm -hmm. to feed our kids to take care of our kids, to be a second set of eyes on our kids in terms of potential abuse. Yes. Um, you know, and I think that many communities, Meg, including in Amherst, they're continuing to have free meal distribution through yep. the end of the calendar year, yep. even for kids who aren't necessarily part of the district. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I appreciate your, your comment about just sort of the, the school being eyes on um, kids that I, I one of the concerns in our district and one of the reasons we did work so hard to um, start with a remote uh, or a hybrid model, excuse me, um, was out of concern for students um, who hadn't had contact with adults outside of their home um, since early, early March and being able to um, really check in with those families. Um, we know, we know, you know, I know, I know there were reports that the number of reports of abuse and neglect had gone down um, dramatically. Um, and as I think most of us understand, that doesn't mean that the incidence of abuse and neglect went down dramatically. It just mm -hmm. reported by schools. Mm -hmm. Well, I want to take this time now to really say a, a heartfelt thanks for all of you spending this past hour with us um, asking critical questions. There's clearly so much more work to be done. Mm -hmm. um, I want to thank the Public Health Institute of Western Mass, Jessica, Kathleen, Sarita, all of the staff at the um, Institute who have made this dashboard possible and have really seen the need and the gap and chosen to respond by making data accessible at a regional level. And to each of our panelists, Representative Dom, Meg, and Gail, just really um, many thanks for you thinking through these questions. Clearly, we've carved out some themes that need additional attention in terms of the data that are available and the legislation that we need to get in place in order to have them become available, as well as what we can do with them. Um, and I know there are so many folks on the call. There's an ongoing chat conversation. Sounds like there's, uh, as you mentioned, already the carve out for next steps in terms of where this conversation can head. Um, but really just hoping everyone remains well and safe and continuing to do the um, difficult but important work that, that everybody is doing. So thank you. And Jessica, I don't know if you have any final words or if we're all set, but okay, great. Well, thank you and um, take care and I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. <laughs>